that one day when we came to the altar and surrendered to him and allowed everything he has done for us to be applied to our lives. Oh, thank God for that one day. Well, I haven't had that one day. Well, today is a day, and it can be a one day for you. For whoever needs it is such a blessing to be in God's presence. I mean, that you, you've already said that. And it's still a blessing. If you have a good meal, do you only, oh, that was a good meal, and never talk about it again? I mean, especially if it's really good. We came up, we were up here, and they, they were talking about some different places they'd eaten or whatever at fellowship meeting or stuff like that, and, or in the past, and they were still talking about it. Some of it's been a while since they've had it. Your brother Ponzo on the one he was mentioning, he didn't get it this weekend. It's been a while since he's had it, but you know what, he's still talking about it. Why? Because it's so good. When you experience God and how good he is, you're going to keep talking about it and keep talking about it and keep sharing it because he's so good for me. He's so good for you. He's so good to each and every one of us. He's so good to even those in the world. It's beyond good because he's giving them an opportunity to come and experience them, him for themselves. Thank you, Jesus. For what he does. At this time, though, we'll wait on you for the Sunday morning tides and all. richly bless you for it. At this time, we'll dismiss the teenagers. Go on up and have a good class with the Clinidors. Looking forward to it. They're having fun up there. And our brother prepares and prays for your children. He really does. Just like the children's church teachers in the back and the nursery workers, they pray for your children. They care about your children. And if you saw even we had an astronaut leading service or leading songs today. He's been leading for the last three weeks. 
what, he's one of the characters in the, in the space camp, stellar space camp back there. It's a blessing. They're having fun back there. They still have a few weeks left. I think after day, today it's three more Sundays. It's going to be, they're having fun. It's going to be a blessing. And on that third Sunday, July 21st, we have our, we're going to have the graduation from the Stellar Space Camp. And remember, 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 next Sunday is Freedom Sunday, July 7th, 11 o'clock. It's Freedom Sunday. Freedom Sunday, next Sunday. Glenn was telling us today, he goes, I don't know about that. I don't know about Jen. She's really, really stepping up her game. Anybody coming for her better come hard. But then I remembered who said they were coming for her, and that was Aurelia. She's going to come hard. <laughs> she's, she's ready. <laughs> oh, no, you're not ready. <laughs> Let her have it this year. <laughs> That's a blessing. But come in your patriotic gear and come as we celebrate our freedom in Christ, our freedom as a nation, July 7th, 11 o'clock, which means that we won't have that evening service. We'll have it instead in that afternoon toward the end of the event, the Freedom Sunday event, we'll have the, the evening service will be then, not the 6 o'clock service. It'll be earlier. So just come, enjoy, spend the time, then you get both services on Sunday. That'll be a blessing. That will be a blessing. And so if you still need to get with Sister Redding about what to bring food-wise, drinks, all that stuff, get with Sister Redding. And if you still have not gotten your name on the list to do some jobs, get with me after church. Okay, so we can get you signed up to help. Because it's our church, right? I'm, oh, okay. Maybe it's a different. This is our church, right? There it is. Yes, our church. So we work together to make it a success. The events are always a blessing, but they're made a blessing. Yes, of course, by God, but by your participation and helping. It really is made a blessing by your helping. Because if everybody does a little, no one has to do a lot. Because there's a lot that goes into it. But everybody that does a little helps, so no one has to do a lot. So get with me if you need some, for something to do, Sister Redding, on what to bring. But at this time, we've got service today. And Pastor Team is going to come and share what God's laid on his heart. We look forward to what God has for us. Pastor? Praise God. So what is a Freedom Sunday? Well, like you said, we're gathering together, and we are, what's the new one or the old one? All right, gathering together uh, to worship the Lord, of course, at our 11 o'clock service. But then we do barbecue. Folks bring food. We have a big uh, time of eating and fellowshipping one with another. There'll be games, activity, events. It's just a good time to be together and uh, celebrate this freedom that we possess, not only in our Lord, but also in this great nation upon which we live. So you don't want to miss it because there's going to be pictures up afterwards. You're like, oh, I should have come. That looks so fun. Too late. Got to wait a year. So come on out next weekend. Praise the Lord, and we'll have a good time in the Lord together. I want to turn your attention, though, this morning to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading there in verse 11. Nehemiah 2 and 11. Good to have each of you here in the house of the Lord this morning. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night... I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then they went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did their work. 
Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. As also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sambalat the Horite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you, will you rebel against the king? And then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. And I want to turn your attention back to two different verses. I'm going to use them for my text this morning. Verse 13. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. And skipping up to verse 17. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And with the help of the Lord for a little while this morning, I want to preach, and we're just going to use one part of this this morning, about steps to rebuilding the walls. Steps to rebuilding the walls that's in our life. But I want to look this morning specifically at removing the rubbish. Removing the rubbish. Pastor Dave, sir, will you please pray? Amen. Praise the Lord. Removing the rubbish. I'll give you a little background of the history of what's taking place here. The children of Israel are God's elect. They're God's chosen. They're God's special people. They began, of course, from Abraham, and without rehearsing the entire history of Israel, they were chosen of God, and God was their ruler. And then the children of Israel, they wanted to be like the rest of the world, which is a problem sometimes in Christians' life. We are separated for God's cause and God's purpose and God's calling, but then we want to act like, sound like, be like, carry on like the rest of the world. And that's what Israel did. They said, we want to be like the rest of the world. We want a king like the other nations have a king. For up to this point, God was their ruler. Now, they used the mouthpiece of, of course, people like Abraham, or excuse me, like a Moses and Joshua, and there were judges that were in the land, if you read the book of Judges, uh, that would lead them as the voice of God would speak through these people to try and uh, direct them in the right pathways. But they just saw what everyone else had and said, we want to be like them. Well, that's a negative in our life. We should not want to be like the world. God calls us out of the world and the things of this world unto a new life in him. So they found their rulers, Saul being the first king of Israel, and of course David, the great man after God's own heart, uh, being the second, and then Solomon, and so on and so forth. But in the midst of their rulership, there were those that would rise up that wouldn't serve God. They wouldn't serve God. They had a knowledge of God. They knew they were God's chosen and God's special people. But they forsook their culture. They forsook their heritage, their legacy of God's children, and they began to Lust after other gods. Of course, we think of various ones, Dagon, the Philistine god, Baal, that was in many of the nations round and about. And they would go, the Bible says, a whoring after, all right, lusting after and, and striving towards and serving these other gods, these gods made by hand, idols. Well, it got them in a lot of trouble. It got them in a lot of trouble. And so finally God said, all right, I'm going to bring punishment upon this nation because I want to get their attention. And they're not listening to my prophets all right, what is a prophet is basically kind of like a preacher, but God uses them as a spokespeaks, and they prophesy about future coming events. He said, 
they, they don't listen to my prophets. They don't listen to the man of God that stands before them. They're not doing what they know to do. They've got their written word. It wasn't a Bible as we know it, but they had their statutes and commands and ordinances uh, and the things that were given to Moses in the Old Testament that we read about. And so God brought and allowed judgment to come upon the nation of Israel. Assyria came in, separated one-fourth, uh, I mean, uh, about ten tribes of the children of Israel from the rest, conquering that nation. Jerusalem uh, remained with Judah, and, uh, and in the midst of all that, finally, the Babylonians, you might have heard the name Nebuchadnezzar before, came in and took over Jerusalem, lying the city in nothingness, destroying and tearing down all the walls thereof, so that it may not be rebuilt again. And then God allowed the children of Israel, the people of Israel, in other words, to suffer. He allowed this because they just didn't want him. They knew about him, but they didn't want him. They rebelled against their knowledge. And so they suffered under the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, many of them having perished in the fight. But Nebuchadnezzar had chosen out various ones. It was a remnant, the scripture says, a group that, that were saved, people like You've heard of Daniel in the lion's den, the three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and in the fiery furnace, etc. And they survived. Well, Nebuchadnezzar dies off. The medial Persian Empire enters in, destroys Babylon. This is giving a little history lesson here. And then finally, the, the Persian king begins to rule. Of course, in the midst of that, Esther marries into the, the royalty. She's the Jew. If you are familiar with the story of Esther, book in the Bible. And now he says, we need to do something for the Jews. We need to do something for the Jews. And he allows Ezra and others to go to begin to build the foundation of the temple once again in Jerusalem. But that after years, it still has never been finished. It just gets as far as the foundation. Nehemiah, a Jew, is working in the king's house. He is a cupbearer to the king. So he's working in the palace. He's got a good governmental job. And in the midst of all this, his heart is longing and yearning for more. His heart is longing and yearning for more. Because he knows what he really needs to be doing. And so God touches his heart. And his brethren come in from having been in Jerusalem, and he asks them, well, well what, what, what's happening down there? Have they rebuilt the temple? What's going on? Tell me what's going on. Oh, it's in a bad, uh, uh, it's been a bad way. It's not all, after all these years, nothing much has been done. The temple's still not built. The walls are still torn down. Uh, the city's barely uh, 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 alive at all, so to speak. Uh, and Nehemiah, he was burdened by this realization that we are God's people, we are God's chosen, we are God's elect, and we're living under the standard that God would have us to live. We are so far removed from what God and how God wants to bless his people that in blessing them, they may see that we are something special. Do you know you're something special this morning? As a child of God, you're something very special, something that the world will never understand. All right, that, that you'll, they'll never begin to realize how it is that God blesses you uh, to the abundance that he does. Does that mean you don't go through battles? No, you'll still go through situations. You'll still through go battles. Uh, the Bible said the sun rises and sets both upon the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, the Christian and the non-Christian alike. Uh, uh, we experience some of the same things. It's hot for the Christian. It's hot for the, uh, uh, for the unbeliever, right? Uh, it's just Houston. That's what happens. And so things will come in our lives. But God has a way of blessing his people even in the adversity, even in the hard times, even in the difficult moments. Uh, God has a way of blessing his people. Uh, and Nehemiah understood this. Uh, and he realized, you know, there may have been this time where the walls came down, uh, but it's time to rise up. It's time to do something. Uh, it's time to let the people uh, out there in the world know that there is a God in heaven, uh, that he loves his people. Uh, he wants to bless his people. Uh, he wants to show the world uh, that he's real and he's alive, and he wants to do it through his people. And the heart of Nehemiah rose up. I want to do something about it. And so in so doing, in so doing, God laid it on his heart to go and to do something about the walls being built. He spoke to the king about it. 
the king gave him permission, got just a real quick outline of the first two, uh, the first chapter basically. Gave him letters from the king saying, you go, I'm giving you authority. You can get the, all the materials you need. Uh, all right, provisions will be given unto you. Uh, there are supplies, in other words, uh, so that you can build what needs to be done. You have my permission. And he took the letters and he took the people. And he went across the river, excuse me, and he went down to Jerusalem. That's where we are in our scripture reading. He's got a heart to see the walls built again. Because as long as the walls are down, the enemy can come in. As long as the walls are down, uh, uh, for these were like citadels, basically, all these, these, uh, many of these big cities, uh, uh, the walls were built about them. Even prior to the Israelites coming into the promised land or into Israel, uh, uh, there were basically like nations, each city kind of like a nation. And Jerusalem was a city without any walls. It was defenseless. And so Nehemiah realized the first step in getting everything the way that it needs to be is to build the walls again. So he got the vision for something more. He got the vision for something better. He realized when he looked upon the, the, the landscape there within the midst of Jerusalem that this is really the pits. It's messed up. How about your life? Do you look at your life sometimes? You're like, this is really messed up. It's laid waste. At one time, you might look at it and say, you know, everything was going so good. Everything was great. Maybe as we were talking, some of us uh, right before service, Betty and Glenn and uh, Jenny and I remember who else maybe we were talking about drinking out of the hoses as kids. Uh, it, it wasn't so hot as it seems like it is now. Uh, I mean, just we, we didn't care. We'd stay out eight hours, I think Glenn was saying, and it wouldn't seem like it was hot, and we'd have a great time. Uh, and we look back and we think, man, those days of our youth, they were so wonderful. They were so awesome. Uh, before everything seemingly like the, uh, the, the Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon came in and destroyed uh, uh, the walls of our life. Uh, uh, we look at and we can remember back to those times where it seemed like everything was going so smooth and then things happened. What happened? The enemy came in. The enemy that the Bible said as a thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You see, because that doesn't come from God. That comes not from heaven. For the Bible said all good things come from God. That comes from the devil. That comes from the enemy of the soul. That comes from the one that wants you to die and go to hell. And he entered in and he tore down all those walls of preservation in your life. He tore down and he took your joy. He robbed you of your peace. He took away your hope and now you're living a life and you're trying to figure everything out and all you see in the midst of it is rubbish. You don't see what it could be. That's how the city was. And Nehemiah, he went by night because yet he had not revealed that which God was dealing with his heart about and as we read to you, he went out on a beast of burden, a mule, whatever. He began to try and ride it through all that brokenness, all those broken pieces of the walls, uh, all the burned gates that the scripture said in verse 13. Uh, all of these things uh, are the, the demise of what was once a great place. It got so bad. So bad was the rubbish, the trash, in other words, that was there. That he couldn't even take the beast any further. The mule couldn't go through it. It was so messed up. But he's viewing it all and seeing, man, don't you see? Verse 17. Because finally he begins to reveal to them what God is doing with his heart. The distress that we are in. You stressed this morning? You look at your life and you say, man, it's really the pits. All right? And maybe your language is a lot more foul than that. But you're looking at it and you see, this is the pits. I'm not even really happy anymore. All I got is aches and pains, rubbish in my heart. It's a dark place. Been there, done that. All right. But sometimes what? You got to see all the walls torn down and everything laid out waste before you realize what you really need to do with your life. Sometimes you got to go to hit the bottom of the barrel where life seems like it sits at its worst before you can begin to look up because you realize you can't go any worse than it is. But if you'll just finally look up, 
if it'll just finally look up. Uh, and maybe it'll be a Nehemiah that'll come by your life as he begins to stir the hearts of the people. Don't you want better for yourself? Uh, uh, I found better. I found God. It's a friend that reaches out and say, you know what you really need? You need God. You need Jesus in your life. I'm not talking about just religion. Uh, I'm not talking about just going to church. Uh, I'm not talking about just carrying a Bible uh, or wearing a cross, whatever. Uh, I'm talking about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for there's a lot of people uh, that have a religion. There's a lot of people that know about the Bible, but they're not Christians. They're not living the life according to God. They don't have peace in their life. Uh, all right. They're just as missing out on it. Uh, but my friend this morning, God wants you to know him, uh, not just his building, uh, not just this edifice, uh, but he wants you to know how wonderful uh, he is. And he wants you to know how wonderful you can be. But you got to give in to him. You got to quit playing the games and you got to start serving the Lord. He stirred the hearts of the people. He said, don't you see what a distress it is? Don't you see how lacking your life is? Don't you see how messed up it all is? Don't you see the darkness that you're living in? Because it's real and it's there. You can feel the crush of the rocks under your feet. You can smell, perhaps, even after all these years, that burnt wood smell. You can still smell the burning of the gates of the city of Jerusalem. But it can be better. My friend, I want you to know it can be better. But only if you want to make it better. Only if you want to make it better. God's not going to make anybody do anything. God's not going to make you do anything. He's going to tell you there's a better way. He's going to tell you there's a better life. He's going to tell you that there, there's walls that can be built. Ways that you can be, your protection, that you can find that hope, that peace, that joy, and live within that city. And that by those walls, you can, like the armor of God, you can put on and protect yourself from the lies of the enemy. But only if you want to. Nehemiah had the burden. Me and I, Nehemiah wanted it, to, but he had to get those around him to help him get what was needed. And so he begins to pour out his vision. But before, once you get the vision, you realize things, you got to get the garbage out of the way. Well, we can look at that in a couple different ways. It begins by letting the sin be forgiven. Because we're all born in sin. Every one of us were a sinner. Every one of us were born in that condition, all right? Uh, it's through, it's in, through and in our DNA, if you want to say that, all right? Ever since back when Adam and Eve uh, committed the uh, sin there within the midst of the Garden of Eden, sin has passed upon all men. And with sin, the Bible said, death also has passed upon all men. For that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're doomed without God. But God, two beautiful words that we find within the midst of the scripture many times, that interjection of the Lord in our life interjected there within the scripture. But God, the Bible said in Romans, while we were yet sinners, while we were rebelling against him, while we were cursing his name, while we were fighting against him, while all this rubbish was within the midst of our life, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us enough, he cared for us enough that he wanted to show us how much you matter. How much do you matter to God this morning? He went to the cross and gave himself upon it. He died for your sins. He didn't die for his sins. He was sinless. He jumped in front of the bullet, if you want to call it that, all right? He's the guy that threw himself upon the hand grenade. He's the one that said, you know what? I'll enter in and defuse that bomb. And it blew up on him. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to know, I love you. I love you that much. And so even in that condition, even in that state, the Lord came and died for us. And we begin by removing the sin, the rubbish in our life, the garbage in our life. By acknowledging we're sinners, inviting Christ into our heart and our life to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to forgive us of the wrong, the sin that we have committed. It's not a hard thing. It's not a bunch of words you got to learn. It's not a bunch of verses you got to be able to quote first. It's not a certain amount of money you put in the bag as it's passed around or give on cash app. Uh, all right. It's not uh, uh, some financial thing you have to do, some religious uh, all right, experiment that must be performed, some memorization of such things. Uh, it's just saying Jesus, I believe you. I trust you. I know I've been wrong. 
come into my life because my life is nothing but a bunch of rubbish. And it can be so much more God. But to begin, the rubbish has to be removed. So take the blood that you shed at the cross of Calvary. The only thing the scripture tells us that can forgive us of sin is, is, is blood. The only agent that cleanses it away is blood. And God, forgive me of what I've done wrong. And Jesus will come into your heart and your life. That's being a Christian. That's where Christianity starts. All right? That's where it starts. Now, is there a progressive sanctification that begins to occur at that time where we continue to grow to be more like God? Absolutely. Are we saved at that moment? Yes. But then we begin to look at our life. So first, we remove the rubbish by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, we begin to look perhaps over the, our life. We can look at our life to see what rubbish is preventing me from being everything I can be for God. Now, you've got the vision. You want to be the Christian, right? You want to be the Christian this morning? Amen. We do, don't we? We want to be that Christian. Okay. Then we have to analyze. Is God's going to build this new wall in my life, which you have to be a partaker of as the children of Israel built the walls by the protection and the power and strength of God and the provision of God. You get to that place. You say, now, God, I want to be more like you. What do I need to do? Begin to look at your life. Begin to look at your life. I prayed. I prayed. I, be, I started serving the Lord when I was in high school, brother Caton. All right. I started serving the Lord some when I was in high school. He talked about his, his experience. And then I got married and I kind of strayed away and all these kind of things. All right. Right. Because I had cool things going on. I felt that were maybe better than those things. And have you ever done that? You were in church. Right. And it seemed good. But then, hey, this opportunity arose. That opportunity arose. This gal came into your life. This guy came into your life. This that. Well, I've never drank this kind of stuff before. What is this? I'm smoking. Any of you? Never. You, you know. Right. And so you started doing things you knew you shouldn't do. And so the whole God thing wasn't that important at that moment. Then God sent me over to Korea. Korea over in the Pacific. And he sent me to Korea. And he took my wife away from me. Well, we were still married, but we were, only, we were newlyweds. We'd only been married, what, eight months, I think, at that point. Man, but every, my wife's my everything. I mean, I really love her, and I, we're still newlyweds. He sent me to Korea for a year. He's like, man, that's longer than we've even been married. This is a pits, all right? Now, I could have found some kind of solace in the things that are over there. Like, like the guys, many of the guys over there would do, they'd go over there, they'd begin to chase down some of them uh, uh, Korean gals, all right, and they'd, they'd go spend all night down in the ville, all right, prostitution's illegal in Korea, and, and they'd go down and do that, they'd spend all night, they'd get drunk, they'd come in wasted, they'd come in smelling like goats the next morning, they'd drink that, uh, what was it, uh, soju, or whatever it was, and it was nasty, my, my roommate would drink it, man, he'd stink to high heavens, get all in your pores, I could have done that like everyone else, or not everyone else, but many of the other people did. So, no, I don't want to do that. I got a wife, I really love her, and I got a God I want to serve. And I prayed. I prayed, and it stuck because I really wanted it. I really wanted it. Do you really want it, or you just want to play the game? Do you really want it, or are you just kind of entertaining the idea? Don't expect all the blessings if you're only kind of entertaining the idea. Because God knows your heart. He knows whether you're in it all or kind of not, kind of so, all right? All right, and many of us perhaps even played that kind of yes, kind of no, and then we had the audacity to blame God, right? Well, I was trying to serve you, Lord, and I, all this happened and all these miserable things. You never surrendered the first time. You gave him part of the deal, but you didn't give him all the deal. You tried to build nice, pretty walls upon top of all your garbage. Anybody? Right? You tried keeping all the foul garbage you were living in, all the trash that you were dwelling in, and everything else that was going on, and you tried living in it, and you tried doing it, and it wasn't working. And what happens? You begin to build the walls on the trash without making sure that the foundation, the rock, the Christ Jesus in our heart and our life is firm upon which we might build these walls. And what happens? The whole relationship thing just crumbles down. Why? You didn't start with the move. You didn't remove the rubbish first. 
And so I began looking at my life. What things are in my life that I know, all right, that are wrong? What things in my life are contrary to what God wants in my life? How did you learn that? I read my Bible. It's reading the Bible. All right, a good place to read is the book of John. As you're a new Christian, begin to read those epistles, those uh, typically five, six chapters each uh, there within the New Testament, letters from Paul, and you're learning. And, and he's talking about a commitment. He's talking about dedication. He's talking about sanctification. He's talking about living right. He's talking about and calling out these things that are sinful, these things you should not be or do anymore, right? All the rubbish that was there in our life. Uh, and I'm looking at all these things, and I'm reading these things. I'm laying in my bed in my barracks room uh, uh, in, in the military, and even on my job because I could do that at night. Uh, and, and just reading my Bible and reading the Bible. And it's like, man, uh, uh, you're not supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. Man, whoa, look at all this kind of stuff. Man, I really need to be dedicated. I, I need to give my life. To com- I want to completely be what God wants me to be. You there? Is that where you're at in your life? Holy and completely surrendered. I just want what he wants. Then I went home on mid-tour leave. You got like a year you got to spend over there, and they let me go home, I think, at five months or somewhere along there. And I went home. I got to see my wife. I told her what all I'd been writing her every day anyways about, man, God, and I want to be a preacher. God's called me to be a preacher, blah, blah, blah. All right, speed it up. And then she prayed for salvation that night. And the next day, the next day, I was removing some rubbish. What are you talking about? Man, I just started looking through our apartment, the apartment she was living in there. All the things that were contrary to God. Man, I went through a bunch of my music. I know you all think I'm crazy, but I went through a bunch of my music. Back then it was vinyl, it was cassette tapes and vinyl. At least I was past eight tracks, all right? Okay? It was cassette tapes and it was vinyl. I was like, man, this is not glorifying to God. This is not glorifying to God. This is not glorifying to God. All right? Say, preacher, that's kind of stupid. No, that's where my heart was. It's not glorifying to God. It is defaming the God that I serve. If I listen to this and people know I'm listening or hear me listen to this, they're going to think that's the person I am. And I'm not him anymore. I'm removing the rubbish. They're going to see new walls in my life. Books, going through books, man, no, this is not good. This is not, I get rid of it. I better get rid of this one. All right, better. All right. God, going through my life. You ever gone through your life like that? Just start looking at everything. That's what David said in the scripture. He, all right. That's what, that's what Paul spoke of. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Look at it. Look at yourself. Do a self-examination. And see, these things are not glorifying to God. They are destroying my building of what I want my life to be. So I need to remove them. I need to remove them. I need to ask God's forgiveness for them, but also I need to remove them. And you grow. Everything doesn't change the moment you get, you get saved. Yes, that part changes, but you've got to begin the work. You've got to begin the work. You've got to do the labor. You, they had to go forth in the midst of the city. They had to take their beasts of burden. They had to take with their own hands and, and remove the rocks and the, and, and the burnt uh, pieces of wood and all that was preventing them from being all that it could be. Their heart was in the right place, but they needed to clean house, as the saying goes. Get the gar- garbage out of the way. And that's what they began to do in their life. And I don't know. I don't know what's in your life. I'm not picking on anybody. All right. But they looked and they knew they knew. And a lot of times if we're just honest with ourselves, we know the answer even before we ask it. True. Are there sometimes questions we ask and we really already know the answer? We already know. My grandkids do that to me sometimes. Poppy. I'm like, you know, the answer. You already know the answer. Why are you asking the question? We know. Why? Because God's already dealing with our heart. We have to learn to respond to what the hearts of God is speaking to our heart about. We pray. We ask God, God, show me because I want the better way. Well, I don't know if these are all the things I want to get rid of. I don't don't know if these things. Hey, God's saying, I have so much better for you. So much better, more than you could ever even imagine. But it's hard for me to give them to you if you're, if, if you're 
if you're content with the trash and the rubbish that you're living in your life. I want good for you. I want great for you. I want exceeding abundance for you. But as long as you keep the trash in the way, I can't build those things I'm trying to build in your life. How about it in our heart, in our life this morning, as we bow our heads and close our eyes and reverence to the Lord? Building, rebuilding the walls. Rebuilding the walls. They wrote about, they walked about, they looked about. And they said, man, I see all this distress. All these problems, all these situations. That are presented here by all these torn down bricks and stones. And the burned wood from the days gone by. And it all's just trash. It's rubbish. And he realized, you know, it's not just me that sees it. He asked them the question, don't you see the distress we are in? Don't you think people see how distressed you are? The darkness that you're living in? The emptiness that you're feeling? The perhaps bitterness that you hold? The lack that's in your life? Not in finding fault, but with a heart that's sorrowful, grieving for you. That's what Nehemiah was doing. Wasn't feeling sorry for himself. But he realized it can be better. My friend, you're here this morning. And that's the message God wants you to know. It can be better for you. But it can't be if you're trying to continue to live it all on top of the trash. If you're still trying to build now righteousness upon unrighteousness, because it'll never stand. It'll fall. And great will be the fall thereof, the scripture speaks of. But God's here to help you this morning. Say, preacher, I've tried. I, I've, I've been. God's here to help you this morning by his power. And begin it by removing the rubbish called sin by inviting Jesus Christ into your heart and your life. To be your Lord and Savior. To enter into greatness in him. Confess your sins to a God that is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. To remove all the rubbish, the trash. And if that's your desire and you're willing to start right there this morning. I don't always ask the question, but I'm going to ask it this morning. Will you just slip your hand up and say, Preacher, this morning I want to pray. I want Jesus to come into my heart and my life. I want to make that step that needs to be made. God bless that hand. You can put it back down. Are there others? I want to make that step that needs to be made. God bless that hand. Are there others? Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. We all start the same way. How about it? Are there others? God bless that hand. God bless that hand. Are there others? God bless that hand. Are there others? God bless that hand. Throughout this congregation, there's people saying, I, I want that commitment. I want that. You might say, I've already made that. I've already begun that foundation, but I'm trying to build with all the garbage in my life. Hey, let God help you clean that up. Why don't you examine things so you know what? It can be better. It can be so much better. And give yourself to him and commit to him this morning. And you'll see the greatness, the greatness that he has for you. Father, we thank you, dear God, for each one that's here this morning. We thank you for those that have raised their hands and those that have not. God, those that desire, God, that new walk and foundation in you, God, and those that have already begun it and to know that there's more that needs to be done. And God, we thank you for each one that's here, God, wherever they may be in the progression, God, of their Christianity, God, or the newfound found, uh, salvation they'll receive today. Lord, God, bless them, each and every one. God, accomplish your will, God, in this altar call, God, as you continue to move in our midst, God, and sweep through this congregation by thy Holy Spirit as we ask it all this morning in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you raise your hand, I encourage you, come on up to the front this morning. As others are finding their places, the altar's open for everybody. You're welcome to come up front. We'll pray with you as you invite Christ into your heart and your life. If you have another prayer you'd like prayed, we're, we're here. We're welcome to pray. Again, uh, desiring to pray to help you this morning. In all things, as we come to the Lord today, call upon him, look to him, and let him bless your soul in a way that only you can. God bless you as you find a place to pray this morning.